Hi guys, last week I extended the CPU interface of my floppy disk controller to allow the 6502 to read actual data bytes from the disk and it was able to read the separate uh, clock and data bytes from my floppy disk controller that form the FM stream of data that gets encoded on the disk. So what I've been doing this weekend is updating the code so that it can read more interesting data from the disk. In particular, if you remember, the last two bytes stored in the sector ID fields are a CRC that allows us to check that the data was received correctly. So I've written some code to actually check those CRCs and also some code to read data sectors from the disk and load image files as you can see here. So what I'm going to do today is talk you guys through some of the code changes that I did to make that happen. Another thing I've done since last week is made a full schematic for the build so far and this is all on GitHub so you can check it out there along with the code and I'll put links to that in the video description. I probably won't be doing any actual electronics in this video, this is going to be much more about the software side of things, but I have also been thinking about and sketching out circuits for writing data to the floppy disk, so hopefully in the next video I'll be able to implement that as well. So let's have a look at some of the code changes. The first thing I've done here is taken all of the code that was uh, integrated into the test programs and I've pulled that out into a library file called fdc.s and this is in the lib subfolder of the source directory if you're looking at this in GitHub. As you can see this includes all of the constants that we had before for the control lines that go to the floppy disk drive such as turning the motor on. Um, choosing which direction to step in or out on the disk, uh, telling the heads to step one track in or out to change tracks, and side select one, which we don't really use here, but it can be used to make the head read from the opposite side of the disk. We also have the three uh, status indicators that come from my floppy disk interface. T0 is a signal that comes directly from the floppy disk drive, and it's active low, like all signals from the floppy disk drive are. And so this one goes low when the head is over track 0, right at the edge of the disk. IDX stands for index. Uh, this is also a signal that comes straight from the floppy disk drive and is active low. And it goes low once per revolution of the disk. And it can be used to give you a kind of fixed reference point for, for how far around the disk is. Byte is a signal from my floppy disk controller interface. It's not coming straight from the floppy disk drive, that's from my circuit. And this is active high and it ticks up once per byte read from the disk so that the CPU knows it's time to read the byte from the floppy disk controller. Then we have the definitions for the four registers. The control register being a write-only register, um, the status register for reading information about the disk drive and circuit, and then the clock and data registers are how we read clock and data information from the disk. Then there's a load of uh, zero page storage locations that the, these routines need. There's a few more here than there were before because I've extended the code, uh, but I'll talk through some of that later. I've got these three constants. So address marks is a special pattern of clock bits that we're looking for to find the start of a field on the disk. And then there are two types of field that we look for on the disk and these constants are present in the data bytes as opposed to the clock bytes. So that's FE for an ID field and FB for a data field. I've also got these three error constants because I added some error checking to the code. Um, I don't do I don't do very much with the errors at the moment, but it logs that they happen so that the calling code can decide if it wants to do something about it. A lot of the rest of the code here is pretty much unchanged. It's just been moved out into the library, so I'll skip over most of that. I guess the interesting new stuff starts from here. So, as I said before, one of the things I wanted to do was make this. Uh, code able to read and check the CRCs of the data on the disk. So floppy disks use a 16-bit CRC and I was able to find some code on mdfs.net that has a really tight implementation of this. It's, uh, it's, it's quite compact and, and elegant. So I was able to take that code and adapt it for my purposes here. So the initialization routine here just sets all of the bits in the, in the CRC because that's the initial conditions that the algorithm needs for floppy disks. Then I have this CRC byte routine. Now, the way the CRC calculation works is it's incremental. I can supply it with one byte at a time, as and when I receive the bytes. And I, all I do is I put them in the A register and then call this function. And I won't go into details about how the algorithm works. It's quite clever how it's been compacted down here. Um, there's more comments in the code on mdfs.net that you could check out if you want to if you want to a bit more information about that. 
but it accumulates the CRC in those two bytes of zero page memory that I've that I've used here. Finally for CRCs there's a check routine here. Now with CRCs they have an interesting property that if you calculate the CRC for a bunch of data and then you feed that CRC itself into the CRC algorithm it actually should end up producing a final CRC of zero. So all I need to do in this check routine is just make sure that the uh, both is just make sure that both of the bytes of the CRC are in fact zero and if they're not then we flag a failed CRC here. So these are some nice low-level CRC routines. With those in place uh, I could move on to write a read ID field function. So we start out by initializing the CRC calculator and then we enter this little loop which is pretty much the same as it was in my test program last week. All we do is we keep reading bytes from the disk and the read byte routine uh, returns a clock byte in the X register and a data byte in the A register just like it did last week. I haven't changed the read byte routine at all here. So we're looking for a clock byte that matches the address mark and if we don't find it we just loop round and read the next byte. At the same time in order to find an ID field we're looking for this particular value in the data byte that goes with that clock byte as well and again if we don't find it we just loop round again. Once we've found one, then we can go ahead and read the data from it, but before we do, we need to feed that first byte into the CRC calculator, because that is part of the CRC. So in the case of an ID field, that's the FE byte in the data bits. Next we read the first actual byte of the ID field, and after reading it, we want to check that the clock was correct as well, and the clock bits should all be set for all bytes apart from address marks. So all we do here is we increment the X register, which should have been set to 255, that should then wrap around to zero, and if it doesn't, then we flag a clock error. This first byte that we've read is the track from the ID field, so it's a record of which track this field is meant to be present on. Um, so we store that out in zero page here. Now, the floppy disk controller has its own notion of which track it's on at the moment, so this felt like a good time to actually check that that's correct. And if that's wrong, again, we just flag an error state here for, for, for it being on the wrong track. Now that track byte needs to be fed into the CRC calculation as well. All the bytes we read are going to have to eventually get passed to the CRC calculation and it's always the last thing we do here before we read the next byte. So here we read the next byte. We check the clock as before just by incrementing the X register. And this next byte is the head number. And the head number is 0 for the bottom side of the disk and 1 for the top side of the disk. So it's sort of an indication of which side of the disk this sector is meant to be on. Um, I'm only using one side of the disk and I don't really care about this number but I'm storing it anyway and we need to feed it to the CRC calculator as normal. Then we can read the next byte, check its clock just as before and this one is much more interesting because this is the number of the sector around the track. So this is interesting because when I'm reading data from the disk I'm always going to want to read a particular sector from a particular track. So I can seek to the right track but then in order to find the data I want, I need to find the ID field that identifies the sector that I'm looking for. So this gets stored in zero page, and this is definitely something that will be used later on. And it gets CRC'd as normal. Finally, we read another byte, and we check the clock again. And this byte is a size indicator which gets stored in zero page, and I'm probably going to ignore this one as well. Pass it to the CRC generator, of course. And then we can fall through to actually check the CRC. So we need to read the CRC from the disk first, and then we feed that first byte into the CRC generator, and then we read the second byte of the CRC and feed that in as well, and then we just jump to the CRC check routine I showed you earlier on, which is expecting the final CRC to have come out as zero. So that routine is enough to read an ID field from the disk, um, and then that gives me the indication of which, of which sector is about to follow, which is going to be very useful later on. I also wrote this find ID field routine, uh, which is very simple. You pass in a sector number in the A register, and all it does is it finds the next ID field on the disk, and it sees whether that one is actually the one that we wanted. And if it's not, it just loops and finds the next one. And that'll just loop forever until it finds the one we asked for. There ought to be a kind of limit on the number of times that loops, or maybe it should look for a number of passes of the index hole before it gives up and says that the sector that you're looking for just isn't there, because otherwise it's going to hang the computer forever. So one day I'll probably have to deal with that, but for now I'm happy with this as it is. Finally, as far as sectors and ID fields go on the disk, 
I wrote this routine to scan for sectors on a track. I'm not going to go through this one in detail, but what it does in a nutshell is it waits for the first pass of the index hole under the optical sensor on the disk, and then from that point on it just watches what data comes off the disk and it watches for ID fields and it stores the sector numbers in an array in memory. And it does that until it seals the index hole pass again. So by doing that it knows it's, it's seen one full revolution of the disk and any sector IDs it found during that revolution it returns to the caller. And I used this routine in a new test program called Floppy Dump. So let's have a look at that test program then I can show you it running. Most of the initialization stuff at the top of this code is just the same as it was before. But in particular what it does is it starts from track 0 and it enters this track loop which loops over all 80 tracks on the disk, numbered from 0 to 79. For each track um, it prints the track number out then it seeks to that particular track on the disk and then it performs a scan sectors to find up to 20 sectors and it stores their IDs in a buffer in memory. It remembers how many sectors it found and then basically it loops over all those sectors and for each sector it just prints out the sector number. So what this is going to do is it's going to loop over every track on the disk, it's going to find out all the sectors on that track and then it's going to print their sector numbers on the screen. So let's take a look at that running. So here's the program to scan a disk and report what sectors it finds on it. So you can see there it's looping through all of the tracks and it's dumping out all the sectors it finds. And the track numbers down here are going to go from 0 I think to hex 27 which is 40 tracks and then the, the next 40 tracks appear on the right hand side of the screen. So yeah, that's working really well. You can see that there are 10 sectors on every track. The first track here, track 0, the sectors are numbered from 0 up to 9. On track 1, the sectors start with sector 7, then sector 8 and sector 9, and then they go back to 0 and count up. And you'll notice that on subsequent tracks, it, it offsets where track 0 is each time. And the reason for that is actually to, to improve the speed of access. The thing is, when you read the data from the disk, you tend to read all the sectors in order on a particular track and then move to the next track. And when you move to the next track, you tend to want to read sector 0 next. But after telling the stepper motors to step to a different track, you actually have a short amount of time that you have to wait before you're allowed to read any data. And I think I checked one of the data sheets from one of the, one of the original Shugart drives, and it was something like 20 milliseconds. So how long is 20 milliseconds? Well, the disk spins 300 times per minute, which is 5 resolutions per second, or 200 milliseconds per revolution. So 20 milliseconds is about a tenth of a revolution, and that's actually an entire sector's worth of the disk. So if sector 0 was stored right at the start of track 1, after stepping from track 0 to track 1, we would actually miss sector 0, and we'd have to then wait for the entire track to go past before we could read the data we wanted. By offsetting the data like this, it gives it some, some space to account for any delay that occurs during that track switch and let things settle before it actually needs to read data again. And overall this leads to much faster sequential disk access. So now that I can scan the disk for sectors, the next thing I wanted to do was actually read the actual data from within those sectors off the disk. So I made a read sector routine. Uh, to do just that and as noted in the comment there you pass the sector number in in the accumulator and you the address in the adra variable in zero page just like for the other routine the first thing it does is find the id field corresponding to this sector now we saw that routine before so this is going to scan all of the bytes coming from the disk until it finds an id field with this particular sector number and once it's found that it will start to read the data field and the way we do that is we reinitialize the CRC calculator because the data field has its own separate CRC. And we initialize this counter to zero, and this counter is going to be used to loop through all of the 256 bytes in the sector.
Before we can read the actual data though, we have to actually find the data field on the disk. Now the data field is located after the ID field. There is a specific amount of gap between them. I think it's 22 bytes of gap from the end of the CRC to the start of the data field conventionally. Um, but rather than relying on the specific time, what we should do really is just wait for that address mark to come up. So we read a byte from the floppy disk, check if it's an address mark. If it's not, we, get, we, we enter this loop. And if it was an address mark, we check whether it's a data field this time. And if not, again, we re-enter this loop. So this is exactly the same thing we were doing to try and find ID fields. But in this case, we're just trying to find the next data field. Once we've found the data field, we can read all the bytes and see or see them. So we need to see or see the byte that's already in the accumulator. Uh, the first time round, this is actually the field type for the data field. But we do the CRC on that, we read the next byte, we check the clock was hex FF by incrementing X and then causing an error if it didn't wrap to zero. Then we can load from our index variable and store the byte in the correct location in memory. We increment the index which starts at zero and counts up past 255 until it wraps to zero again. If it hasn't wrapped, then we go and read another byte. And remember that before we read the next byte, we also CRC the previous one. So that will all loop quite naturally. Um, after this wraps to zero, we still haven't CRC'd that last byte, so we have to CRC that byte. And then we just jump into the same CRC check routine that we saw before. So that's simple enough, I think. Let's take a look at the code that uses it. So what I wrote here was a routine to load an image file, like, as in a display image, from the disk and display it on the screen. Now my display is 640 by 480 with 3 bits per pixel, so these files are quite large. I think they're, they're somewhat under 200k, which is good, because that's the maximum capacity for a single density, single-sided 80-track disk. The way, the way I'm storing this data on the disk isn't using any particular file system, I'm just storing it in the uh, 10 sectors per track, starting from track 1 and going out as far as necessary. So this program only has a few variables up here. Um, in particular it tracks the Y coordinate on the screen, which starts at the bottom of the screen and works up. There's also a little buffer here that it reads the data into, because if I'm not reading the data straight from the disk onto the screen, I have to read it into memory first and then unpack it a little bit, just because of the way my video memory works. Most of the initialization stuff here is basically the same as it was before. Now I'm not going to go through all the code in much detail here, except to point out, I guess, that it's looping the Y coordinate from 479 downwards. There's a track loop, so it loops over the tracks one by one. For each track it steps in once. So I'm not really using the seek routine here either, I'm just relying on the head being in the right place already. Then there's a sector loop, and we start and we read the sectors from number zero through to number nine. So all we do is we read that sector and it reads it to hex two thousand into the buffer that I defined before. And then there's some kind of funky code here to write the various channels of data into the right bits of my video memory and that's a little bit complex because of the way my video memory works because it's got a kind of a planar architecture so it has to write the blue and green channels first and in fact the first 160 bytes of the sector are the blue and green data for the line so it's reading 160 bytes worth here and and just copying them into video memory once it's done that it can do the red channel and the red channel is stored in the next 80 bytes which go up to number 240 and this is stored with 8 pixels per byte instead of 4 pixels per byte but in my video memory I have to split that into two 4 pixels, four pixel bytes so yeah this is a little bit more complex than the other one but with that out of the way it can move on to the next screen line the next sector if it hasn't reached sector 10 then it loops back to the sector loop if it did reach sector 10, then that means it's run out of sectors on this track, so it needs to go to the next track, and it loops back to the track loop instead. So aside from the complexities of dealing with my video memory arrangement, that's actually really simple, and for things like loading program code and, and, and so on, that's just going to be really easy to use. So let's run that program now. So that's ready to go. Let's see if it can read the file. So what you can see here is a little test card I made for the 640 by 480 3-bit per pixel uh, 
graphics mode. Um, seems to be loading really well. It's quite fast as well. So yeah, that's effective. I also I can also change the disc and load something else. The resetting and this disc contains the Gouldian Finch. Exactly the same data I used to load from an SD card, but this is now coming from these floppy disks. It does tend to get some errors I find with this one. I think this particular disk might be a bit faulty, because um, the other image doesn't generate these kinds of errors, but this one does it fairly consistently. I can reset it and show you again. So we'll see how this one goes. Yeah, there you go again. It's sort of near the top of the head, it tends to get some errors. Sometimes it also gets them further down as well. But yeah, this other one never gets the errors, so I think it must just be some issue with that particular disc. Anyway, there you have it. No hardware changes were necessary from last week to make all of this file loading stuff possible. It's all just software changes to, to make the code do different things. Now, there are hardware changes we ought to make to make some of this a bit easier for the CPU. Uh, things like making it more interrupt driven. I might look into those at a later date. But I think the next thing on the cards for the hardware side is actually a write circuit. And I have been drafting out what that circuit might look like. So hopefully in the next video, I'll be able to build a functioning write circuit. As always, thanks for watching, I hope you have enjoyed it, and do let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts or suggestions.